how'd you start your day that day? Sorry. My platoon was uh, asleep uh, and woken by a uh, explosion, which is relatively close to our barracks. Uh, it was uh, close to the sound of uh, what we've been getting, which is a B-10 recordless rifle. Uh, once we woke up, then we started uh, our, our operations as we would do to support the elements that are on uh, force protection which is uh, running ammunition and uh, supplies to the front. Okay. Um, describe what happened uh, just uh, as, as the day went on. Like, uh, talk, talk to me about your day. As the, uh, after the first explosion happened, uh, I started gathering my men, putting on our gear, our protective gear, and uh, grabbing as much ammo and uh, lubrication as we could. And we started pushing people to the, or my soldiers to the, uh, the vehicles that were in force protection. Uh, once soldiers started leaving the building, we knew that it was a different kind of attack. Usually we get attacked by uh, small arms fire from one location or an uh, incoming round from a different location. But this day was very different because we were getting everything from every location, from indirect fires to RPGs to small arms to accurate sniper fire and discus. My men uh, grabbed what uh, ammunition and uh, lubrication they could and started pushing it to the trucks that are on force power. Uh, why did you need well, it's just that uh, once that they get engaged in a firefight uh, with the main weapon systems of 50 caliber or the 240, uh, it's good to continue to lubricate those weapons in a firefight to prevent any stoppage or jams. Um, what weapon did, were you carrying? I was actually carrying multiple weapons at the time. I went from my uh, personal weapon, my M4, to a, a 240 laughing sniper rifle, back and forth, whatever weapon system I could grab at the time. And why were you grabbing so many different weapons? Well, uh, we were firing so many rounds, it was easier just to pick up another weapon that had a uh, full clip of ammunition in it that was uh, nearby, and then another would reload the rounds in, or vice versa, handing off rounds to everybody else. Okay. Um, describe to me uh, the volume of fire at its, at its peak. It was extreme. It was uh, something that you would imagine in a, in a uh, Vietnam era movie, World War II movie, or, or something that you would watch. Uh, it was hundreds of thousands of small arms rounds of machine gun fire and just constant uh, incoming uh, direct or uh, indirect fire from the B-10 recordless rifle or possibly a mortar tube and RPG rounds were shot from all elevated positions from 360 degrees. It was non-stop, it was round after round. Uh, all rounds were accurate and very close to uh, everybody that was running and trying to perform their jobs. And uh, your job was to bring ammunition to, uh, to the fighting position. Finding positions at Fort Detect? Yes, uh, my job was to, to ensure that was happening, uh, pushing soldiers in, or my soldiers in different directions to different trucks to uh, resupply them with what they needed. Describe what it's like to, uh, to run through that, that volume of fire. Uh, initially, it's, it's mind numbing. Uh, you, are, you have a lot of fear, um, but you know deep in your mind that, that uh, as a leader, you have to get those things done. And you, you can't put fear. Uh, within you, you have to push it aside. And at, mo at, at most times, we were uh, like going into to autopilot or a machine, if you will, that uh, we didn't think on, act on a fear, but we acted off of instinct. Okay. Um, what kind of things did you see as you went through the course of the day? Uh, a lot of explosions that were very close. Um, a lot of soldiers that were tired. A lot of, uh, uh, at some times there was a, some panic. Uh, I saw a lot of uh, injuries that uh, needed to be aided for. I saw a lot of uh, uh, blood, sweat, and tears that day. How, how did you motivate yourself to motivate them? I went back to uh, some of my uh, relatives, my uncles, uh, that had been in the same situation when he fought in Vietnam. And, you know, he gave me some words of wisdom that you cannot ever you know, let yourself down. You cannot ever uh, let your soldiers see any kind of weakness, no matter how good or bad it is. And then I just uh, built confidence off those words and uh, try to focus it on my soldiers. The, uh, were you part of the effort to, to retake the uh, combat output team? I was part of the effort. Uh, what we did is between Red and myself, we bounded forward to take uh, over the entry control point. Red was basically the main effort, but at the time, it really wasn't first platoon or third platoon or headquarters. We were all basically one platoon working together. I, I humorously called it purple platoon because red, the red and blue. But uh, 
we were all a family at the time and we knew we had to take care of each other so we worked together hand in hand and uh, that describe that fight to retake retake Keaton. the fight to retake was basically red initiated a movement and we bounded along with them providing them cover fire once uh, the red element which was staff sergeant romache and a few soldiers from my platoon and his platoon went and engaged several AA fighters that were penetrating the EC or the entry control point at the time. Uh, once we uh, attained that small victory, it was motivating to know that, you know, our soldiers are, are, are great fighters and then they, they faced uh, the worst of adversities and, and punched back as hard as they could possibly. Uh, describe the fight itself. What was it? I mean, how close, close hand, hand to hand? It wasn't hand to hand, 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 it wasn't close hand, but it was, they were engaging enemies within uh, I would say an estimate of between 30 to 75 meters. What's it like to fight at that range? It's uh, I myself did not engage anybody at that range, but from from the experiences of my soldiers that did, they uh, it's it's exciting, but at the same time, it, it there's a lot of fear. Uh, pulling the trigger, I mean, I don't think that anybody wants to ever be in that situation where they're that close. We'd rather have a larger standoff, of course, but. Uh, it's exciting, but it's 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 painful at the same time. Okay. Um, describe. Uh, was there any point where you're sitting there, and were you in any position where you're like, you know, chances are I'm not going to make it. I did, but I didn't show it uh, because I had to be strong for my men, and I wanted to know that uh, we were all going to make it through this, and we were all going to continue to fight hard. Um, did you have anything to do with the uh, casualty collection point or uh, taking care of the wounded? Uh, I did. Myself and uh, other elements went to uh, cover each other's uh, backs again to move forward and bound forward and collect our heroes. We refer back to uh, the war ethos of that we never leave a fallen behind, they never leave a fallen soldier. And uh, so we went and policed up our heroes and we also uh, provided first aid for those who were wounded. Um, describe the, uh, the medical situation. The, the medical situation was at one point when I had men securing the uh, first aid station or the aid station was uh, sounds that I don't ever want to hear again. Uh, it was basically inside that aid station it was a bloodbath and knowing what uh, what was coming from some of the soldiers and the very few ANA that were in there was was uh, probably something I'll never forget. Something that you would only imagine in, in, a, in a horror movie of some sort. The, um... Describe uh, what was what the medics and the physician's assistant, uh, how you think they did, what they did. No one could have asked better of uh, our medics and the physician's assistant. Uh, those guys performed flawlessly. They did everything they could to save lives and, and patch soldiers up to get them back into the fight. Uh, I, I don't think at one time did they show any stress or any, any grief of any kind. They continued to do what they were trained to do and they did it uh, to the best of their ability at all times. Uh, did uh, describe why you couldn't get uh, your mortar system working? The, mor the mortar systems weren't working because they were basically pinned down. Uh, the mortar system was roughly up against the mountainside and they were getting overwhelming fire from above them. So every time they attempted to man the mortar tube, they were basically pinned down by uh, heavy machine gun fire or accurate sniper fire. How did that hinder things for your defense of the cop? It hindered it greatly initially. Uh, we couldn't get effective mortar fire on enemies uh, that we typically do on uh, sporadic uh, engagements. Uh, it was painful not to have them, but I, I know if they were in the fight, they would have done a great job. Were they able to send ground uh, reinforcements at any time during the battle? They, they came uh, later that evening, but uh, you know, any time that we got them was, was great to have them uh, come aboard and assist us and securing the cop and help us uh, completely sweep the entire uh, the uh, FOB or the cop at the time. Um, describe the battle by the time uh, the ground reinforcements had come. Um, before they had come, basically uh, a few hours before they arrived, uh, there was uh, the enemy fire started to slow down, uh, I believe because the Apaches and the Air Force were hitting them pretty hard. Uh, so we were constantly getting uh, Apache fire, A-10 fire, and uh, Air Force uh, bombers basically uh, laying down a, a real heavy barrage of fire on the enemy. And uh, I know uh, pretty much all the burnings build down, burned down, but like one. Like, is that correct? 
uh, for the most part. Okay. It was actually two. Two. Um, I know one was the barracks that you guys transferred, created into your own makeshift cop, and I take it the other one was the, the aid station? The aid station remains standing. Okay. Um, describe, what, describe what it was like to, to look at Keating at this point. It was uh, painful to look at after the fight, uh, seeing uh, burnt out buildings, Humvees with large holes in them. Uh, you saw some, uh, some blood of your, your fallen on a, on a lot of equipment and uh, the uh, enemy fighters that were uh, still kind of waiting to be recovered and uh, things like that. I mean, the only way I can really describe it for anybody to understand is, is, is take a good look at, a, at any kind of Vietnam movie and seeing an aftermath of what they might have went through was pretty accurate to what we went through.